to, I'll get you guys to help me give a warm round of applause for Liam, uh, uh, Mark, uh, I keep forgetting your names, what do I call you? David and Peter from New Game Plus, our backstage crew. So, it's no surprise that New Game Plus and previously the, the other show, Level 3, have been have made a major presence at events like this. So, you know people like JC, you know people like Brad, you know people like John, you know people like Dar, but you may not know us. And we have a, quite a large role in, the, um, in the making the show as well. So, before we get into making the show, I want to go through and we'll introduce ourselves. So, I'm David. I first got into... Um, um, this particular gig, doing graphics, so all the graphics you see, all the intro sequences, um, a lot of the website graphics as well, is my work, and as well as being one half of the filming and editing crew, so a lot of the filming, a lot of the lighting and editing the episodes together is what I do, and I'll pass on to Mark. Yep, my name is Mark Siley, um, I manage the actual website, um, so all the content that you see that goes into the website, I upload all the, all the videos, um, render all the videos um, so that they're capable of going into all the different um, avenues that we release the episode on, um, as well as all the segments. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much what I do. Um, Hi, my name is Peter, and I um, have been doing the music this year. Um, also, um, in the past show, I helped with um, what events were on, some retro stuff, and I still do that as well. Uh, I'm Liam. I'm the other half of the filming and editing uh, team. Uh, I sort of focus also on events. Excellent. So what we hope to do today is show you behind the scenes of not, not so much just New Game Plus, but the general process you'd go through to create a TV show um, or any sort of production for that matter. So uh, we'll start with where we start on any production before we even turn a camera on and before we even invite anyone into the studio. And that's pre-production, and that's mostly Liam, so I'll hand it over to him for now. Okay, so um, obviously we're focused on game reviews and features. So we need to work out what games are coming out, um, who's going to review them, and how we're getting them. So obviously as a sort of a, a game show, we do get some games from publishers, but we don't get every game. So the games we don't get, it's up to the host where they want to actually purchase them. And now we have a... Do we have the photo? So we have a big whiteboard that we use to plan the episodes. We have uh, features that come up regularly, like Bradley's anime segments and the weirder retro guys. So this is just a quick little snapshot. So episode 12 is uh, the one that's going to be air on Monday. So we know we've got some reviews, like Q-Men, uh, Spider-Pig is the Amazing Spider-Man, and Spec Ops The Line. And we know Spec Ops Allied has been uh, filmed, but it hasn't been edited at the stage of the photo. So with this board, we keep track of what we want to do for this episode, who's doing it, and what stage we're up to in it. And by having four, we know we can plan in advance. So we know for episode 16, which is after our boot camp episode, that we have... It's not written there, but we probably have a weirder retro. So we know we need to film a weirder retro before this date. So this lets us know what's coming up and plan accordingly. Excellent. Um, so yeah, that's the major part of pre-production uh, pre and it's a huge part of the process in order for us to keep on schedule and make sure everyone knows what they're doing. So once we do that, we move on to production. So production involves everyone coming into the studio. We set up sets, we set up lights, we set up cameras and we set up mics and we get people from the camera to do their thing. So we're going to show you some of the equipment that we use and um, what we do. So we'll start with the cameras. So this is uh, my little road case, and this is what I take to events. And we get quite a lot there. So our main camera. So th this, uh, you do the tripod, please. 
This is, I believe it's a Canon XA10. Um, it's only a little camera, but it's very, very beefy. And so the main advantage that we got with this camera is, what we see on the side here, it has two XLR inputs, which are high quality microphone inputs. Some of the smaller cameras, some of the DSLRs, they don't have those kind of inputs. So that was the main motivation getting this. Also, um, and we'll go through the DSLR as well, but the major advantage it has over that is it's able to run for long periods of time without, um, without turning on, without uh, turning off or overheating. Um, so, which brings us to the DSLRs. So we use a 550, a Canon 550D. Um, and this we're able to get a very, very good image out. For those who aren't familiar with shooting film with digital SLR cameras, um, they have some major advantages in that we have changeable lenses, we've got much, much better lenses, and we can get some really, really good shots out of the SLRs. And from about, oh, probably about two or three years ago now, they, they started being able to actually very accurately capture um, HD footage. The downside of those, however, is there's no, th they don't have the audio inputs. So we normally use this as a second camera. Or if we're at events and we can't use this, I've got a portable sound recorder that I can use. Yep, excellent. Um, the other advantage is both of these run off SD cards. So you get some cameras that run off mini DV tapes, although uh, they have some problems with magnetics, so we decided not to go for those. You have ones that run off like, um, the, it's called a P2 card, it's like a big old memory card, but they're very, very pro proprietary, they're hard to get footage off, they're hard to get readers. So we've gone for the stock standard in the middle of the range um, SD cards, and with, with that we can capture footage from both cameras easily and um, without trouble. Although there is an inherent issue with using two different types of cameras, and that is, no matter how hard you try, the shot will always be slightly different. So we need to do a bit of work on that in post, but we're getting to post-production later. Um, sound. To sound? Yep. Okay. So uh, if we're using this, uh, the mics are going straight into the camera, there's no issues with syncing. If we're using this and another system, or both cameras, the sound is not attached to the video, so we need to sync it. I think you all know what that is. Uh, we have a couple of different types of microphones. This is mainly used for events, like uh, recently at Oz Comic Con, I do some interviews. Just the handheld mic, just great for on the go, that sort of stuff. And we also have lapels, which go here. That's sort of more of a studio indoor thing. Yep. So we'll get those out. Um, yeah. Wait, wait for it. <laughs> there we go. So we have a little lapel mic that we can connect to a number of things. And that easily just clips on to any sort of interview or, or if we can get on the fly. Um, if we can get location on the fly, we'll do that as much as we can because they're unobtrusive, they pick up a good sound and they yeah, and they just look a lot more professional. Um, so we, we do that whenever we can, but obviously when we have to, we run a cable to a wide mic and uh, the wide handheld mic and uh, run that off. Uh, so in terms of uh, sort of cameras and sound, it's, it's one of the things where you have to use what you have and you want to get the best result you can. Uh, so these mics aren't necessarily top of the line, but they are very, very good. Yeah. And that's actually a good um, segue into lighting because we've brought in two different types of lights today. Uh, yeah, we get to that. Um, So in here we have. Uh, no, we get the redhead first. Yeah. This is a well, it's an it's a China Bay version, but it's a standard sort of redhead light. So it's a high powered light. It's 800 watts, and we use that. We set it up on one of these big old lighting stands, and then we get a, we get we use that to get the majority of the lights for our shot. Um, the issue with them, though, is they're, they're very, very harsh lights. So you get very, very hard shadows. You get very, very strong highlights. And it's not particularly what we want. So we also got these soft boxes. And what they do is on the, oh, tight, Oz, on the inside of these, there is sort of a metally foily type surface, as well as a whole bunch of sort of what they call a scrim. 
uh, between that and the light source. So what, what, what happens is, if you can imagine the light rays coming out directly out of the light, they go inside there, they bounce around, they get all frazzled up. So the light is light never rays. going, the light rays are never going directly from the light to the subject. So you get a very soft light and you get softer shadows and you get a much nicer image. Um, so the, the, the soft light is important because generally uh, the hosts, particularly Jason, are uh, very sort of sensitive about their image and they, they need to look pretty. <laughs> so it, it's, it's very, see, see Brad's laughing because it's true. Uh, so we, you know, we've got to take that into account. Yeah, yeah, and we've got to take timing into account as in half an hour for Jason in the bathroom before she... <laughs> um, so that's one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, when we don't need such soft lights, this is like a $10 light from Bunnings. So, and this does just fine, and we will, we will uh, put this maybe on the side or behind our subject, just to get a bit of uh, what's called rim lighting, which separates the subject from the background. And they're also very, very handy for putting uh, gels in front of So if we want to, say, light up a curtain or a wall, we can set up one of these on the floor. Now, th this is where we, um, we were talking a little bit about using what you have access to. Um, it's great that we have these lights. They were pretty expensive, at least for our level of show. Yeah. Uh, now, using so like $10 lights like this, uh, you've got to be careful about how you use them because they are very bright. But using lights like this against not using lights at all is going to be a huge increase. So I think uh, what I was saying that, today before... That, that is one of the key things with the camera. Even if you're using an iPhone or even a not iPhone camera, some sort of bad camera phone, you can still get a good image if you give it lots and lots and lots of light. Um, so that, that's why lighting is so important in any sort of studio thing or even outside studio thing you're doing. Um, so that's a great point. Uh, a lot of events we go to are inside dark rooms or halls where we can't set up lights and stands and things like that. So the latest example was we were down at Acme yep. for their Game Masters presentation uh, and Expo. Uh, that's a, on a segue, that is definitely worth checking out. <laughs> uh, but it is obviously lots of video games, so it's a dark room, which means when we want to have the host doing, you know, talking on camera, it comes up too dark, so we've got a little light it's, you know, it's lights them up a little bit and you can change how bright it is. Yeah, yeah that does the job. Definitely a worthy investment. Um, so we've covered cameras, we've covered sound, we've covered lighting. So I think that covers production. Yep. And then we need to move into post-production. So we've brought in um, the, the Premiere file. We, yeah, we do use Premiere, um, not After Effects, um, uh, not... Um, um, what is it called? Final Cut? So, so when that. we started, we were using my computer, so we were editing on Final Cut Pro. And I think uh, you can either use Final Cut Pro or um, Premiere. There's a, a range of great uh, editing programs you can use. I would say pick one and just use that one. Do yeah. not try to cross-platform. Yeah, that's where we had big issues. I mean, like, we, we would have used Final Cut if we if we were going to go the Mac route, but we didn't have the Macs, we didn't want the Macs, so we decided to go Premiere, and it's done the job just fine. Um, so here is a standard episode, and as you can see, we've got all the assets in the, in the side here, so these are all the things that go into the episode. Um, and I say these are all the things. Oh, we're missing icons for folders, that's all right. But um, so that's, that's at the minimum view, and we've got more here and more here and more here, and here, and here, and here, and here, and here again, and here, and here. Now, now David, with this file, this is the episode file, are yep. we doing individual uh, project files for each segment? Yeah. Uh, the, the point I want to make is all of this is one episode, which you do from week to week. Um, so a lot of stuff goes into a single episode. Um, 25 and a half minutes is a long time. Oh, it's huge. It's absolutely huge. Um, so, generally, once we get the, the footage from the cameras, we'll bring them into their own sort of sequence. Um, so, I'll load up one of those. So, here we have the, the news. Um, and we've got our footage from the host playing their leaders instead of hosting. Um, and there's Don at the news desk. So, we cut all this together, and that's in its own sequence. Um, and from there, actually, no, it won't play too long. So and while the 25 and a half minute clip with everything in it is quite daunting and I'm one of the people who edit it and I find it scary, um, when you break it down to two to three minute clips, 
uh, sorry, segments that you then put together, it's it's a lot more manageable. Uh, and I think what at the start when we first started the show, the first couple of episodes, uh, Dave was fo- focusing more on graphics, which we'll cover it later, yep. and I was editing. And for one person to do all the editing is a lot of work. Uh, so I think you just got to make sure that you've got a, a good team and you delegate the tasks. Yeah, and, and technically as well, it, it can be quite difficult to share files and edits between between um, between a couple of editors without losing file quality. So that's that's definitely an issue we have to cover. Um, I reckon that'll do us for um, editing. Do you want to talk about your graphics quickly? I'll do the graphics real quickly. Um, most of the graphics, although I'm a I love using Maya. Anyone else in here use Maya for, for any sort of 3D work and things like that? No? All right. Well, the, I'm having a workshop later in the week, so you can learn there. Um, <laughs> here's the guys the audio. Um, I've found for this, there's actually another program by the name of Cinema 4D, which is wonderful at doing all these lovely sort of 3D motion graphics. So what I would do is I would create a project in, um, in a 3D project in Art Cinema 4D, and then run it through After Effects and they're at all my little pictures and lighting effects and things like that. So that and so that's a very, very brief way of doing the um, the opening sequence. But um, for the little graphics we had between each segment, we, we needed to get them out quickly. So I chose come on, let's go a little bit closer. There we go. Chose one, one camera move, one graphic, and if you've watched the show you'll be familiar with these. And did that in by the same process, and then just copy paste, change the color, change the text. So that is a huge tip if you have to do a batch of things. Find a theme and follow it through, and you can get a lot of stuff done quickly. Now, now I- using the example of your sort of flyby themes and the intro sequence, the effects are only just one part of it. There's another component, isn't there? Yes. Music. Oh. So we have <laughs> Oz here. Let's tell us a little. Uh, do, do actually, let, let, let's play something of Oz's. Yep, yep. Should we unveil the new uh, market? Now, um, this is uh, sort of a bit of an unveiling. We haven't played this before. This is um, going to be the new version of the intro. Mind you, it's it's, it's similar. Can you hum it? <laughs> uh, not bad. Now, Oz, can you tell me a little bit about um, how you made this and the variations you made? Um, I started off and I figured out a main theme for the for the whole show. And w- as um, David said, you find a theme and you stick with it. Uh, um, there's no time to do um, ver- lots of variations in, um, when you're doing shows like this. So, um, and that's something I've always done in music. If you find something you like, just repeat it. Um, that's the way things stick in your head, and that's what we want with this, the music. You want to be able to hum it and have other people hum it, and it's the best thing as a musician to hear someone else humming your own to something that you've written. So um, I had a lot of ideas from from Jason and other people from the show um, leading up to the first episode on what to do, um, but I never had a clear impression of what I wanted of what we could achieve for the the intro sequence until I saw um, David's graphics, and once I saw that, I I had a lot more of an idea of of how to set the song up. So the song at the moment doesn't quite fit the graphics, but once um this one comes in the weeks coming, um this should suit the graphics that um David has worked so hard on, and um. It, you get a real good sense of of it fitting, because the, the music actually changes as the camera pans around during the, the opening graphic sequence. 
Uh, now, after we've done the editing and we've put in the titles, the facts, and there's some leaders and some other stuff, some breaks we need to put in for Channel 31, uh, we then pass it on to Simi. Simi, can you tell us what you do with the show once we're done with it? Um, well, once I get the show, um, basically I, I run it through another encoder just to bring it down in bitrate so that it's suitable for the web um, so people can stream it and download it so that it's not too large. Um, so that, that's the first step. Um, and then basically I upload it to various um, portals like um, the main portal we use is Blip TV, so that, that's embedded into our website. Um, and from there it goes out to YouTube, uh, it goes out to iTunes, um, and we also send it out to Easy TV. Um, so we, we actually, you know, we own the show, so we have no issues with people torrenting it, so we put it up there. So, um, Simi, why do we have so many different avenues? Um, different audiences, people want to use different um, devices to, to get the show, so people might be using, you know, um, iPhones or whatever, you can get it on iTunes. Um, people want to use their PC, they can use Blip TV or YouTube. Um, and, you know, if people want to download the torrent, they can use whatever they use to, you know, watch those sorts of um, files on. Have you had any, uh, is there any issues or things people should watch out for if they are distributing their, their show or their whatever they're doing online to different mediums? Um, I think it's important to try and keep the, the file format um, the same as what everybody else uses. Um, at the moment, MP4 um, seems to be the, the standard. Um, previously, it was AVI, um, but M MP4 is definitely the standard to use now. Um, and just try and try and keep your bitrate good enough so that you're getting quality out of the video, um, especially if you want HD. You want it at least up around 2,000 kilobytes for the video. Um, and, yeah, I think it, it's just important to try and keep it consistent. Okay, so we've sort of uh, covered a bit of what we do. Um, we're going to open up to questions. If anyone has any questions about what we do or what you do, if you want any advice or anything like that, any questions, just raise your hands. Hello? Hello. How many hours altogether would it generally take to put an episode together? Um, we generally allocate, what was a three hours twice a week for filming, and then that again for editing, um, and that, that that's if everything goes to plan. Um, we've we, we've often had things where we've had super busy weeks or things have just gone wrong, and we've had two or three nights a week we're at the studio till like four a.m. getting stuff done. Uh, I think this week is a very good example of, or this week and last week, uh, the most hectic weeks possible. Uh, we had uh, Game Masters, Game Master Press, Game Master Interviews, uh, Oz Comic Con, and then Boot Camp. Uh, but, you know, despite all these events and the, the hecticness, we still have to put on a weekly show. And that's kind of, that's sort of important. We've got to be on time and keep working. And sometimes we do run uh, into the night when we're filming, but that's just the way things go. And that doesn't include all the hours preparation on finding out what games are coming up, um, researching what events are coming up, organising people to go to events and film interviews and um, writing the music. It's just, yeah, it's a constant constant thing. Uh, it's, it's a lot of time, but I think, um, I speak for most of us, is we're, we're very proud of the work we do um, and we're happy to do it. I think at the end of the week, these guys probably hate me because I'm the one that's hassling them for the actual episode to, to, to get it up and online. Um, so, yeah, it's, um, they, they, they do are under a lot of pressure and that sort of thing. So, um, I think, yeah, it's, it's definitely a big effort. You wanted another question, I think. I think we have a question, yeah. All right. Um, hi. Um, have you ever considered using After Effects possibly over Premiere? Because um, I know certain people have different opinions on that, so... After Effects with Premiere, we do often use it for the graphics. Um, my graphics generally always go through After Effects with some sort of uh, some sort of sparkle or effect or spit shine. Um, but the, we don't really generally need to go through After Effects for the film. We, we do do a color grading, and I've been using um, the DaVinci Resolve software. They have a free version of that, DaVinci Resolve Lite. It's a free version, and they restrict it to 1080, so you can't do 4K. Um, 
So that, that, that's definitely worth checking out if you like color grading. Um, we've also been using speed grade, which is part of the CS6 suite. And, but apart from that, we generally don't need to go outside Premiere once we've done our filming. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, do you make any money out of this or is it just 100% voluntary? 100% voluntary. Easy question. Anyone else? I've got a friend who wants to look into green screening. Do you know how easy it would be to set something like that up, uh, even at a small level? It's not hard to go into Spotlight and get a green cloth and or, or um, Bunnings and get it some green paint, set up a wall. The, the issue is lighting and um, finding the space. Um, I mean, like, there's the post-production, there's a million in tutorials on the internet, so if you put the effort in, you can, you can figure that out. But the trick with uh, green screen is to have a consistent green, and your paint might be the same size, the, the, the same colour, but your lighting not necessarily is. So you, you need to you, you need to think of investing in some lights as well, even if they're the ten dollar Bunnings lights. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, when you light the green screen, is you have to light the green screen and then the person in front of it. Uh, so it's more lights and more effort. Uh, the one thing I found with green screen is um, it's it's achievable and you can do uh, decent stuff. But nowadays, people spot it from a mile out, and unless it's very good, maybe think about doing another doing it another way. Hey, uh, with the music that's written, do you uh, actually you have all the instruments and you write it yourself, or do you? mix samples, and if so, what program do you use to mix? Well, going with the, um, that we don't get paid to do this, I've been using free music composer software called um, MuseScore. Um, I was, I do have another one called Sibelius, but they're basically MIDI based, because um, I'm old school, I write music rather than using samples and, and arrange them. Um, so that's the way I do it. But but I'm sure there's better ways to do it. I'm just, yeah, I'm old school, so I actually write the music um, in, a, in a score composer and then play it and record it out of that. Um, so those music programs actually, Sibelius especially uses samples of real music. Um, MuseScore less so, but it's a lot easier for me to use. Uh, any other questions? No, I think we're done. No old uh, question? Out the, the front? Oh, yep, cool. Didn't see him over there. Got to raise their hands. I can't just, like, wave. How much would all this camera and lighting equipment cost all up? Um, it's, it's a bit... Uh, some of this is mine and some of this is New Game uh, Plus. Um, The X10A retails, I think, just over a thousand. No, um, no, no. Retails just over two. Just over two. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Um, the the five hundred five 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 fifty is closer to a thousand. So yeah. Um, again, the lights are closer to five hundred. Yeah. Oh, the the mics again, two each. Two, uh, two mics at about two hundred each. Um, yeah. So, uh, considering the previous question, as hundred percent volunteer, it's a lot of pass the hat around and that kind of thing. Uh, I think uh, the kit we've built up is is, is still building. Uh, it, is, it works for what we need to, to work uh, with. Uh, but I think what I'm trying to say slowly is you can not spend a huge amount of money and still get a good result. Uh, so you just need to sort of work out what you need because we could get a camera that's 10 times better and it'd be great, but we, don't, we might not need a camera that's 10 times better. It might be focused more on getting more lights or more sound or work out what you want to do and then work from there. And yeah, we, we've got this equipment because we have people who are willing to chip in the money um, and, and to, to, to get that extra bit of polish. Uh, but if, if you're working on a project where you don't have that much money or people aren't willing, then you can make do with, um, with the cheap stuff, the cheaper stuff. Also, you can source it from secondhand sales and... and like sales on it, major electrical um, and equipment suppliers. Like, if you can find something on sale, grab it. If you think you're going to use it. Um, and just last thing, uh, if you have any more questions or you want to speak to us, we will be in the new game plus area at the back. 
I think that's it. All right, thanks, guys. And while they're packing.